Hope you're having a great day, and welcome to Coast View, where we celebrate every single morning the people who are making Coastal Mississippi such a great place to live, work, and play. We have a very special show today. Before we get there, just want to share a couple of quick quotes with you. One is by Susan B. Anthony, and it's short and sweet, but it is so true. Independence is happiness. Independence is happiness. It's certainly true for the United States of America. Isn't that true? But it's also true in your life. You know, as I as I have found my way to retire in my 50s and ultimately had the opportunity to do this show, I think one of the things that makes my voice potentially more relevant when I decide to get onto an issue is that I'm super independent. I'm very independent. And you can you can trust me to shoot straight, to tell you the way that it is. And, uh, you know, a lot of people in media, unfortunately, aren't as independent. And for a lot of reasons, there are a lot of reasons for that. Some of that is, you know, there's no way around it. Some ways, in some ways, you know, people, it's hard for people to feel independent and willing to say it like it is because sometimes it might make somebody upset. So a lot of people want to steer away from conflict. But I do think independence is happiness and uh, everyone should, should, should strive for that. The next one is uh, a really good one. And I'll tell you who said it after I uh, share it with you. The unprepared mind cannot see the outstretched hand of opportunity. The unprepared mind cannot see the out, outstretched my hand of opportunity. And that was actually Sir Alexander Fleming. He's the guy who discovered penicillin. And um, um, it's true, though, man. It's all about in preparation. Our next guest, for a matter of fact, Dave Dennis, knows a lot about preparing your mind and uh, you know, I'll tell you more about why I believe that's really relevant in this moment. Uh, but Dave is, uh, is the president and owns uh, specialty contractors in on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and he's a good friend. How you doing, Dave? I'm doing well, Ricky. Thank you for having me on. That's good. But you you can relate to that, Doug. The unprepared mind oh. cannot see the outstretched hand of opportunity. Well, it, I've I've heard people talk about luck that say. You know, you're lucky or this person's lucky or, or some people have luck just tend to flow their way. That may be true, but you've got to be prepared to understand it and see that this is an opportunity and you've got to be able to receive it. Well, the same is true with opportunity. Uh, opportunity may knock a number of times in your life, but if you have, I won't even say vision, but if you just have the perception to understand it's a chance. It's a chance to either uh, enhance your stake and quality in life or, or those around you. So I think it's a very, very valid uh, comment. And I, uh, I think it's one if we all live by it, we probably would uh, have a little smoother ride through life. We would. It's, you know, it's about positioning yourself and training yourself and leaving no stone, stone turn, uh, unturned. Someone asked me why I went back to get my MBA after I was already working. And my answer was I didn't want the fact that I didn't have an MBA to stop me at some point in the future. What I was trying to do is line up all the dimensions that were necessary for success. And when the opportunity came, I'd be prepared for that. But it was, you know, it's um, there's no rest for the weary when you're burning the midnight oil to prepare yourself for opportunity. But that's just the way it is, isn't it? Well, it, 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 if you're in a ball game, if you're if you're an athlete, if it's a ball game, if you're a business person, if you're a parent. You know, what do you, how am I going to prepare for these kids? If I've got a small child and they're sick, how do I prepare to, to take care of them? And if this kicks in, what are my reactions? But it's, it's true in life. It's true in parenting. It's true in marriage or relationships, certainly in business, sports. You pick, pick an arena. It doesn't make any difference. So uh, uh, it's just being properly prepared. And generally speaking, it works. Not always, but most of the time it does. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm holding in my hand something I want to share with you. I got a, I got a hey. really, really special letter in the mail from Kiev, uh, Ukraine, from my friend, Laurie Jackson, who's a, yeah. who's a, 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 um, a, a, someone who's been over there for quite some time helping. She's been vo a volunteer helping with foster children and lots of stuff like that. But, um, but she's an independent m uh, missionary and uh, very religious based. You know, there are a lot of Christians in, in Ukraine and uh, she checks in from time to time here on Co Coast View with me. But it was a Christmas card that was sent before Christmas, and I finally got it. So I guess that's that gives you a sense of what it takes to get a letter from Ukraine these days. But, you know, Jay, uh, Dave, when I think about Ukraine, it makes me sick that it's become a political, you know, pawn. And, you know, this, yeah. this you know, the division of the world that we live in today. 
And I think about those poor people in Ukraine. I think about that whole part of Europe and why this is such a critical war. Um, I mean, this, it is strategically important for America. But, you know, it's unfortunate it's become sort of a political ball, too. Well, two years ago, you know, they lived in relative freedom. Uh, cer- certainly, I think when you look at our country and you see the freedoms we have, the freedoms to, to move around generally safely, feel secure, financial security, uh, bil- ability to worship as you choose, no matter what your calling may be. Those are things I think we take for granted here. The general safety of walking down the street or the sidewalk, you feel comfortable. Ukraine had most of that in play two years ago. In February of, of 22, obviously, it, it changed dramatically. They knew it was building up. But um, you, you have to give them a lot of credit for defending their homeland and the perseverance that they've had just simply to defend their freedom and their families. Uh, I mean, it's a war-torn country for sure. But, uh, Ricky, I think when you look at life and you see what they're going through, we get on our hands and knees and say our prayers at night. You just need to be thankful thankful to the good Lord that uh, uh, we're in a more secure place than they are. But your friend, did she come over here last year? Did she make a trip over? Or you, I know you, you've had several shows with her. I've seen that. And uh, perhaps they were from Ukraine rather than locally. They were here. all from sure. Ukraine. Yeah, they're all from okay. Ukraine. Yeah. I did see a couple of them. <clears throat> so, yeah, uh, special, special situation. And man, I, I pray for them. Have my Ukraine flag flying right here in the studio. Uh, yeah. Hey Dave, listen. We were gonna, we're gonna, we're co- we'll circle back and kind of get an update on the coast uh, economy, et cetera. But I should remind people that you spent seven years on the Federal Reserve right here at, out of the New Orleans Federal Reserve. You were three years a chair there. You were actually a national facilitator for the national branch directors that had unbelievable access to the chairman of the Federal Reserve. What you learned about the economy and the interconnectedness of the regions of America was incredibly important. And uh, given the current situation as it relates to the banking challenge, um, what, um, you know, what, what's your, what's your, what's your statement about where we are? I think we're, we're, we're fine. Uh, are there some choppy seas ahead? Perhaps no one, you know, certainly none of us know that, but the two banks that went down over the past week, Silicon Valley, and then also signature bank that wound up collapsing over the weekend, both of them were heavily invested in in tech, which is very, very speculative. A lot of startups, a lot of tech. Uh, there was a lot of venture capital money that was loaned out through Silicon Valley Bank in California, primarily with a lot of startups. That some of them, when they come out, they may be a, a an incredible home run, so to speak. But they also had a strong basis in cryptocurrencies, the bitcoins, the stable coins, and some of the things that. The candidly is just no tangible asset to go with. Uh, there's certain venues that crypto may work extraordinarily well, but as far as an asset, as far as being a collateral, uh, if I were to take a, a uh, if I went down to a bank, any bank in the state of Mississippi or, or probably anywhere and said, I have, you know, 400 crypto coins here, would you loan me $10 million? They're probably going to uh, say the door is right over here, guys. Y'all head on out. But, uh, the banks, really Silicon in particular, uh, Signature, I think, just got a little overextended. But Signature in particular had done investments in a long way, meaning they had long-term investments at a certain return. And then as interest rates came up, they're paying out more. Their return is here. And then suddenly they're paying out more than that return. So uh, the payout is higher and, and you know, they're going to drain the cash reserves. And that's that is one of the uh, legs of the stew that got kicked out. Crypto was one when it uh, went in free fall. And then the speculative tech market, uh, uh, as the economy tightens up, some of the speculative venture capitalist uh, uh, investors are not necessarily as willing to invest into some of those markets. So really the three mainstays they had uh, all were getting hammered at one time. And uh, then they had a report come out. Well, I mean, you've seen all this. They had a report come out where they were trying to raise capital, which simply meant we got a problem. And that, if that's not a red flag, nothing is. Well, you know, we got it. We've o- over the course of our economic history, we've got many lessons along the way. So many lessons about how fragile the economy really is. You know, the mortgage-backed security situation back in two thousand and eight. Certainly, the pandemic. Man, I mean, I don't think we really fully appreciate how much 
shuffling of the deck occurred during the pandemic and oh. and how fragile it all was how it, when you have it in balance when you have low inflation and low unemployment and things are really cooking and th- great investments are happening and you know to get to that place that's a hard place to get to isn't it dave it's it's very hard it's like i mean you're you're a boat guy ricky you out on the water a lot you get your boat up on a plane you get it on a plane and it runs great when you slow it down and start getting into uh, some choppier seas, which is where the economy is, in, in fact, I think you know, most people would suggest it's headed that way. You get in choppier seas, your boat ride, it's its a rougher ride, but it also takes a lot more power and a lot more energy. Well, in the, in the banking arena and financial arenas, same same situation. It takes more let's capital do, sometimes. Hey, Dave, let's do this. We're at the end of the segment. We'll pick it up right there on the other side, but that's a great analogy, I might add. This is Dave Dennis, and we'll see you after this break. Welcome back to, of course, you have my friend Dave Dennis, who who uh, owns specialty contractors. We visit from time to time about the economic situation as it relates to this region, not just coastal Mississippi, but this region, you know, multiple state region that we are part of. But today, it's a it's really important conversation because Dave actually served seven years with the Federal Reserve out of New Orleans and had some national um, committee seats and it was in, incredibly engaged uh, in the Federal Reserve, so has a really, you know, and he, he's, of all the people that I know, stay, Dave is the most significant human sponge I've ever met. He remembers <laughs> birthdays and phone numbers, and he's just a he's just a really smart guy. So he's really really uh, learned a lot about this, and and he, you know, obviously his message is we're going to be okay. I think we're we're learning more that that um, that we're in a sort of a a situation where because of the pandemic and maybe because of the mortgage-backed security situation in 2008, everybody's a little bit, you know, one of my one of my bank president friends, for, you know, uh, you compared it to screaming fire, you know, and, you know, the, as a joke and 100 people getting killed in the stampede. It's just, it's hard. It's hard not for people to want to react given the, all the, you know, they just li- we live in an uncertain economic situation right now. It's uh, and it can be scary when something like this happens. But Ricky, a couple of things, uh, and I, I will steer clear of any political comments. But what I'm getting ready to say, perhaps by some, may be uh, considered that, but it's certainly not intended. When when the federal government is forcing institutions and corporations, but in this instance, financial institutions, to focus away from what is their core book of business, which is trying to return a, some kind of return to their stockholders so that they can service a community, so they can sponsor little league teams and participate. They're, they're required to focus away from uh, candidly trying to make a, a good business and a good living. Uh, and it seems in many instances, financial institutions simply for this conversation today only, they're having to uh, move into markets that are very marginal that uh, perhaps are, are very risky loans that they're having to make just simply by by dictate. And that puts him in a tough position, particularly in a soft economy. And yeah. uh, that comes into play in many instances in the financial arena. It certainly is uh, an item that is, is uh, I think, hammering them also. Hey, listen, uh, I have a lot of friends who are bank presidents. That's one of the one of the benefits of having been a former publisher. You get to speak to people across this region and develop friendships yeah. with them. Um, and I've had communication with several of them. And um, to a person, every single one of them says essentially the same thing. And that is that they really have billions of dollars to draw down. You know, since since new new legislation was enacted, new reserve requirements are out there for banks, you know, that you know, in the Southeast especially. Let's let's take the Southeast for example. One of the things they point out is that, in fact, more banks over $100 billion fell than banks between 10 and $100 billion. So this, this thought that that the regional banks are in trouble, well, they actually, the regional banks, especially in the southeast, may be actually more diversified. And so they're not they're not having, as you pointed out, they're not having to uh, to chase some of these more risky schemes or whatever you want to call them. Well, if, like if, you, if you recall, Valley. some of some of our local banks here took a hammering job a number of years ago when the petrol prices went down, when a, a barrel of oil went down, their stock was reflective. Well, they diversified enough that the primarily the banks in the South uh, and in most banks around the country, community banks, and as you say, most of your medium-sized banks, they're, they're heavily invested in 
real estate, not speculative real estate. They're invested in businesses. They're invested in personal loans and other things. They're not. They're not into crypto. Uh, they're not into certain areas that are typically they could be very high reward and high return. But there's a very high risk. It's like getting up to bat uh, um, in a baseball game. If you swing for the fence every time, you're going to connect on some, and you're going to look awfully pretty running around the bases with a home run. But you're going to strike out a lot. And the banks that, to me, invest in their customer base that is that is solid, uh, yeah. that just takes a lot of risk off the table. And the banks that you know and the, and the bank presidents you've alluded to, I think probably to a T, every one of them are in that category. That they've yeah. They, they've taken some chances, some risk, which you have to, but by and large, uh, they're protecting the assets of their stockholders and more importantly, of their depositors. Well, what, uh, what one of my friends referred to it is stay away from the exotic stuff. <laughs> That's the way he described well, it. True. He said, you know, do the normal, do normal banking, which is serving yeah. local communities, et cetera. And I, you know, I do my banking with Hancock Whitney and uh, I've watched uh, John Harrison's leadership of Hancock Whitney very, very closely. And of course, I was over. I was over in New Orleans as publisher of the Times Speaking in Nola dot com when uh, Whitney and and Hancock came together. And and I think the bank that you're referring to around the energy diversification or the the, the energy situation might have been Hancock Whitney, because been. because what 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 happened is that Whitney was very very heavy on the commercial side, especially in the in the energy sector. And one of the think one of the brilliant moves I think that John and Hancock Whitney made was to to really focus more on diversifying, you know, to try to get sort of this growing bank that they have to be doing more of what traditional banks do. Not to say that they're still not going to serve the commercial markets and the energy sector they're going to be, but they're not they're not nearly as as uh, energy sector heavy as they used to be. And I think that was a really smart m- move. It actually serves them well, well I, in I situations. Do, I, do I mean, it, it yeah. takes your focus away. I'm in commercial construction, and if we stay focused simply on one on one wavelength or one bandwidth, so to speak, and that bandwidth gets soft, then, you know, we're we're perhaps in trouble. So the idea is to have a number of cylinders you can hit on. And uh, if if we're looking at, say, eight major bases, if we're hitting on six or eight cylinders, we're doing pretty dang good and, and trying to hit on all eight. Well, that's what I think the financial institutions are, are doing. And they are they're going to certainly abide by the, the rules, the regs and the laws in terms of uh, where they have to to make some loans that perhaps are a little more marginal than others. But in reality, they're going to do their best to service their customers, service certainly the investors in the bank that put their money up so the bank can actually uh, go loan and grow a community. And But by and large, banks are, are fairly healthy. Uh, their stocks uh, took a hammering when Signature and, and Silicon Valley went down, but they're seemingly climbing back up at this point. Uh, I, I would say as an outsider looking in, because I'm not engaged, I've been chairman of a bank, uh, uh, did get paid $200 a month to chair the Federal Reserve. So uh, that was always a nice handy 200 bucks. But anyway, the the reality is banks seem to be very solid. And my take on the community would be we're in, in pretty good hands with the banks that are operating on certainly on the Mississippi coast and as far as I know around the entire state. I, I, I agree. By the way, one last thing, and we because and, I want to move to the local economy and get your quick read on it. Uh, the joint statement by the Treasury Department, the FDIC, and the Federal Reserve over the weekend was a really wise move. Um, it gave uh, some ammo for local banks to be able to you know share that we're all in this thing together, and I think we're going to be fine. Um, hopefully, we've weathered the storm and can move on. Um, hey, before we got a short amount of time left, because of the business that you do, you do a lot of commercial work. Um, right. You have a good, you have your finger on the pulse as the barometer of the economic situation. What do you see in here in Coastal Mississippi currently? Ricky, we, I mean, we we had a phenomenal year in 2022, and 23 is off to a robust start. And as we look at backlog and where we're going over the course of the next six months, year to year and a half it looks strong as molasses. And I think what most markets look at uh, where, uh, well, I, I tell you one of our barometers is the industrial market. If the industrial markets that we work in are looking ahead, they're not just doing maintenance work, but they're doing uh, projecting growth patterns and, and expanding 
quietly expanding things so when a market improves they can jump in we're doing a lot of that we're working in in uh, four or five states right now and it seems to be in the southeast that that's uh, the pervasive thought process uh, the markets here are strong mobile uh, airbus is going gangbusters uh, New Orleans market has, has certainly come back nicely after Katrina, and there's a lot of activity in southeast Louisiana. The Mississippi coast is going fairly strong in a lot of areas. Home building has been phenomenal. I know interest rates are up, but uh, I suspect uh, that it's going to be a temporary uh, phenomenon that we, they'll probably come back down some, probably not where they were two or three years ago, but they'll come back down some. But the coastal market seems to be strong. Car dealers can't get cars to sell. I mean, it's, it, you look at a lot of different markets and they're strong. You can yeah. try to get in a restaurant on a Friday or Saturday night. Yeah, uh, no, I know. Uh, I pulled out onto the, out onto the interstate the other day and I told Ann, Look at the traffic. Look at yes, look at but, this. What in the world is going on? Instant, uh, by the way, you mentioned Airbus. I was publisher of the time of uh, excuse me, the Press Register in Mobile, and and uh, had just finished leading the oil recovery planning effort for, for Governor Riley. But simultaneous to that, he was he was traveling to the air show in Paris, and he was really engaged with Airbus to get to get this facility opened in Mobile. And it, w it was successful in getting it open. And we knew that the impact was going to be great, but it's been terrific, man. Maybe we can talk more about well, that it, the next it, time we talk. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Well, we, we can. We, we do a lot of work in the Mobile market, and it's, uh, and it's, it's, it's very, very strong. And uh, I was in South Carolina last week working on some things. We got a job in Charleston. And all the way through, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, anywhere you look along the interstate, it's uh, – it's robust, very robust. This has been Dave Dennis. We'll see you after this break.